The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money. And with me on the line from New York, I'm very pleased to say I have Mark Skousen, who, is in, who has a long history of... Um, being an econ- a professor of economics, and I think he started as an economic analyst with the CIA from 1972 to 1975. He later worked as a consultant for IBM and other companies, and he was a columnist for Forbes magazine from 1997 to 2001, and has contributed articles to the Wall Street Journal and various other well-known papers. He's been a speaker at investment conferences and has lec- lectured for think tanks. Grantham University recently named its business school the Mark Skousen School of Business in honour of his many achievements. Mark was recently named to a list of top 20 influential living economists. He's a member of the American Economics Association and the Mont Pelerin Society and is an award-winning financial advisor, best-selling author and university professor. He's also a producer of Freedom Fest, which uh, this year is running from July the 10th to July the 13th, and it's an annual conference held in Las Vegas and billed as the world's largest gathering of free minds on liberty. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Delighted to be with you. Um, tell us a bit about Freedom Fest, because that's obviously um, an upcoming event and uh, um, well attended, and uh, I think our listeners in Europe in particular uh, probably are not as aware of it as they should be. Yeah, I've, uh, this will be our seventh year, and we hold it in the <clears throat> world's largest, uh, most laissez-faire city of Las Vegas, uh, world's uh, <clears throat> entertainment capital, as they say. And during the day, we have this great intellectual feast uh, where we talk philosophy and history and science and technology and geopolitics, uh, healthy living, uh, a little bit of a renaissance gathering, if you will, of libertarians and conservatives from around the world. I see it as kind of an international gathering or general conference for uh, free-minded uh, individuals who believe in liberty and so forth. And we we expect over a couple thousand people. Uh, Fox News uh, is going to be a major network. Uh, Stossel, John Stossel, is doing his show there for the first time. So we're very pleased, and generally speaking, we don't invite politicians because they never tell you what they really think, uh, but we do make an exception for Ron Paul and his son, Senator Rand Paul, who will be with us this year. Uh, Steve Forbes and John Mackey of Whole Foods Markets are our co-ambassadors, so we, we bring together a pretty cool group of people, and all the freedom think tanks are coming uh, from around the world, uh, whether it's Cato or Heritage or Reason uh, or, um, uh, you know, Barbara Cohn brings her uh, fr- free market uh, uh, organization there from, from Vienna, Austria, uh, the Adam Smith Institute. There's all kinds of uh, groups that, uh, that gather there. Um, the idea is to bring together everybody physically once a year to learn and to network and socialize and celebrate liberty or what's left of it, if you will. This year our theme is Are We Rome, since we are at Caesar's Palace. And so if your if your viewers go to freedomfest.com, they'll see our two-and-a-half-minute video on Are We Rome, uh, referring to the <laughs> West. And uh, decline and fall is, is on the minds of a lot of people, whether it's America or Europe. Uh, or the West in general. So that's just kind of a summary of what we do every year at Freedom Fest. Uh, and it's really a fun event. It's kind of a conference that I've always wanted to go to. There's so many breakout sessions, and you create your own seminar uh, conference that uh, no, nobody's ever bored when they come to Freedom Fest. Well, that sounds that sounds sounds great, and I hope that some of our uh, listeners can can actually make it. Um, you mentioned decline and fall in the context of the Romans. This time, is it decline and collapse? Do you think? I mean, we see what's going on with um, uh, the rate at which they're printing money, uh, the pro- intractable problems in the banking system, and also the intractable government deficits. Uh, how, in the sort of broad general sense, do you see things panning out, Mark? 
Well, uh, I think it's inevitable that we have these boom-bust cycles uh, uh, as a result of Keynesian economics, kind of a, 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 an elixir of, of Keynesian economics and uh, monetary economics gone amok, uh, where basically between fiscal and monetary policy, they're, they're both rather negative uh, in terms of providing stability uh, and so it's, it's, I think, unfortunate that we go through these uh, boom-bust patterns because I think it has, uh, we're basically selling ourselves short. There's so much technological advancement that's going on with new technologies uh, that we can live uh, a wonderful, uh, advanced economy uh, that's within our grasp. We certainly have that capability if we would only unleash the entrepreneurial spirit and not have to worry about the boom, this boom bust cycle, which, uh, as the Austrians point out, is creating a lot of um, malinvestment. And uh, this is a misuse of resources, and it's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. Now, uh, you'll, you'll note in my comments a sense of optimism that technology is still there and you have people working this very day on new technologies and how to improve the quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services that Carl Menger talked about. That was his way of describing the, uh, <clears throat> the economy and not just in terms of GDP or total spending, but the quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services. That sort of thing is still going on uh, by uh, scientists and inventors, uh, you know, the Apple uh, uh, people or, or Samsung or what have you. I mean, we have to, we must never forget that, uh, that optimistic side of the economy. But it's being dragged down constantly by the, uh, by the boom-bust cycle of over-regulation, over-taxation, and uh, uh, over uh, um Overexpansion of the money supply, if you will. So these all have their ill effects, and I think they need to be. Uh, um, you know, austerity is the name of the game. It's it's inevitable when you have these excesses that have been created from time to time. But I don't think it's going to. You know, you you mentioned I I, I see decline and fall in terms of our monetary and fiscal policies, but I don't see. This, the, I don't see this as a total collapse at this point. Right, but uh, so we're sort of almost um, in suspended in a animation, I suppose, on your analysis insofar as they're not allowing the mal investments to be unwound, uh, but we're continuing along at considerably less potential than we would otherwise. Would that be right? Well, I would actually disagree with you a little bit. I think that uh, to the extent that private companies are readjusting their portfolios, uh, cutting costs, uh, being more productive, being more uh, careful with their debt structure. That sort of thing is going on. So restructuring and downsizing and um, reexamining um, where you want to put your money, that sort of thing is going on. And corporations are wisely playing it conservative. They are sitting on you know, U.S. companies on like $2 trillion in cash, um, and the, the, they are in better shape financially. Even the banks are in, most banks are in, in the United States are in better shape financially. They paid off a lot of their TARP uh, loans and are looking uh, better on their balance sheet. So that's the positive thing. The problem is the the governments, I think you have to make a distinction between what government is doing. Government is making things worse. They are taking on greater debt in general uh, and uh, making things worse. There's no doubt about it. So the private sector is in pretty good shape, but the public sector is still suffering from the worst uh, uh, effects of Keynesian economics, which is this idea that... Uh, you can uh, spend your way out of any problem. Yeah, absolutely. I think another way of putting the Keynesian solution to all this stuff is uh, if, you, if you corrupt the figures, no one will notice. 
<laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I, I think, I think we are noticing, uh, I think they, it's hard to hide this. I think in today's world, uh, things come out. We, we have a, we have a very active media who are constantly, we, we have great blogs like this one and, and yours is not the only one. I mean, there are literally, uh, thousands of these blogs out there and, and reporters out there that are digging out this kind of information. The biggest problem is what is being taught our students, uh, and it's reflected in the media that consumption is the key to uh, stimulating the economy, and if the consumer and the business aren't spending, then government should step in and spend. This is the Keynesian mantra that is so destructive uh, and, you know, I just saw an article in the New York Times, there's a whole book on this, how austerity kills. And, of course, there's a downside to austerity. And, yes, suicides go up and, and bankruptcies go up. And the, there are serious uh, ill effects to uh, the inevitable austerity programs. But uh, it's just like a company that downsizes, like IBM. I was a consultant for IBM in the 80s. And IBM has turned the corner and turned around rather dramatically after going through a very painful downsizing in the 80s. So we can learn a lot uh, from what companies do to solve their fiscal problems uh, and their excesses of the past and how they get lazy and, and fat and have to cut out the fat and reorganize and rebalance their portfolios uh, government seems to think they're exempt from this, but they are not. They have to uh, respond uh, to this, and they're not willing to do it because you have people like Paul Krugman out there saying, we need to double the deficit. We need to triple the deficit. Uh, this is the only solution, and, and it's just digging a bigger hole, I, I, I fear. Yeah, no, I, I, I would go along with you on that one. Uh, there is another aspect of government which I'd be interested in your views on, and that is the constantly rising cost of welfare, which uh, I think one of the, uh, an American professor, Kotlikoff, um, came out with really very alarming figures some time ago that uh, the, uh, if you like, off-balance sheet um, uh, net present value of those uh, costs uh, is, is, is adding something like $11 trillion to uh, li government liabilities every year. I mean, that's an enormous number. And it's difficult to see how governments having weaned people onto welfare, actually get them off it. Can you give us any hope in that direction? <clears throat> yes, um, and you're right. I mean, there, you have to make a distinction. I think what you're, the study you're talking about is the entitlement problem, but I would, I would separate that from the current welfare system. In other words, there's a difference between the Social Security and Medicare entitlement expenses and the so-called short-term welfare state of food stamps Medicaid uh, and and those kinds of uh, you know Section Eight housing. There's all kinds of programs that are out there. Literally thousands of programs. And the only and yes, uh, it's out of hand right now. It's excessively um, uh, it's an excessively uh, generous welfare system that we currently have. And even the food stamp people and they've changed the name to SNAP. So getting food stamps is is easy as snap uh, is the way I, <laughs> I look at it. And uh, um, there's 47 million. They're trying to encourage more people. Do you know anyone who needs to get on food stamps and, uh, and trying to take away the stigma attached to being on the dole? These are very unfortunate policies. But to be optimistic, I would say just go back to the Welfare Reform Act of 1996 uh, that um, – Bill uh, Clinton and the Republicans uh, pushed through, and it was very successful for uh, up until 2008 financial crisis. People on food stamps actually declined because one of the requirements was if you are able-bodied after five years of welfare, you have to you're, you're off of welfare, you're no longer qualified, and you have to go get a job. And so <clears throat> that sort of thing is what we need to get back to. And we haven't done so under the present administration, but that's uh, there. There is optimism. We do know the solutions. Uh, we can move on. To, we we know the solutions. We know the so we know the solutions to all of our problems, 
both monetary and fiscal. It's just that we're not willing to face them. It's, it's, yes, it's, it's the willingness to face them, isn't it? And uh, this comes back really to the mal, in, uh, you know, the, the mal investments that have accumulated, really not, I think, over just the last cycle, but over a very long period of time. Um, politicians would do all do us a favour if they felt able to face up to them, but I suppose that we wouldn't vote for them if that was the case. Yeah, uh, I do think that there is a political side of political economy, if you will, uh, that is not often taught in economics courses. Uh, Public choice is all about this political economy, and it does demonstrate that that it, it taxes are, you know, people are more willing to accept new government programs than they are higher taxes. So there is a tendency toward deficit spending, and that's why public choice economists like Buchanan and so forth have always advocated a balanced budget amendment like the states have. And a lot of the states are, are not suffering like, uh, like the federal government and other nations are because they have a balanced budget amendment they're required to live within their means yeah absolutely uh, broadening it out a little bit i mean we've we've been talking about the u.s uh have you any views on what's going on in the eurozone I mean, this is um potentially a major global destabilizing factor if um a major country like spain or italy creates a banking crisis which ripples on rather like rather like the credit anstalt crisis in the 30s um is, is this something you follow very much mark well, certainly we have to all follow what's happening in Europe because Europe is uh, the direction the United States is headed. So over here, we we watch with uh, great alarm as to what is happening uh, in Europe. Uh, and and one of the things that I find disconcerting is the uh, misinformation out there. You know, we have the same problem in the United States. Is this really austerity or not? And in the case of the UK, my understanding is that uh, they keep talking about austerity, but in fact, government spending continues to rise and taxes have increased. That's not the solution that the Austerians or the Austrians uh, uh, advocate. They would advocate lower taxes and uh, real government cuts spending. And my understanding is in Greece, for example, that it, while they've cut certain areas and so forth, they've still yet to um, uh, eliminate a single government job. They haven't fired any government workers. Now, I could be wrong about that. I know that was the case a year ago. It may still be the case. I don't know. Uh, and then I do look at countries like Estonia, and others have dismissed this as a small country that's based export-oriented, and so this doesn't apply but they have had real cuts uh, in government spending. They have actually reduced taxes, and their country is growing at seven or eight percent, from what I understand. And I also like to point to Canada in the in the mid 1990s as a classic example of austerity, where they did cut a bloated government. They did fire 60,000 federal Canadian workers, which was a lot of people. They balanced their budget in two years. Uh, without going into a major recession. And their country turned around. They engaged in 11-year supply-side uh, tax cut policies. Their corporate tax rate is now down to 15%. Uh, and their Canadian dollar is now equal to the U.S. dollar. So they didn't have much of a financial crisis. They have had uh, some deficit spending uh, during the financial crisis, but they're digging out of that. So uh, I think we need to look to places like Estonia and Canada and even Australia, New Zealand, which did not suffer uh, significantly. And, of course, all of those the, – the, what's interesting is Krugman – I've talked to Krugman uh, personally uh, uh, regarding this, uh, and he's always uh, saying, well, they were export-oriented, their commodity economy, and so that got them out of it. But the point is that all of these Keynesians, like Krugman, opposed the austerity programs when they were imposed. Even though they turned out to be a success, they were not willing at the time to support them. So it shows the vanity, if you will, the arrogance of the Keynesian profession who now feel they're in the driver's seat. 
Yeah, no, that's interesting. And uh, I think um, there's an interesting point about uh, austerity in Europe. In many of these countries, the austerity is not falling on the on the public sector, as you uh, intimated with the example from Greece, but it's actually falling on the private sector. And we've right. seen we, we, we've seen with France, for example, um, a combination of income taxes at seventy five percent of the top end plus wealth taxes have taken quite a number of people. I mean, and and movers and shakers uh, into the tax uh, uh, bracket of more than one hundred percent. So <laughs> it's like shooting know, themselves in the foot, though, because uh, yeah. as you know. The, uh, the basis of, uh, of the support for the public system depends on a vibrant private sector. And when they tax them uh, at these high rates and regulate them as they do the labor market, you're not getting a recovery. So it's almost a catch-22 situation uh, that's, that's most unfortunate. But, you know, there is um, – Adam Smith uh, has this wonderful quote in The Wealth of Nations about how – the, uh, the the daily uh, acts by individuals to improve their condition um, achieves a higher level of progress despite the greatest administration of errors and the greatest blunders <laughs> of government. And uh, exactly <laughs> that, that uh, senses, you know, uh, Adam Smith's optimism, if you will, that I share. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're not talking about the black market activities. We're probably sustain a lot of these economies, uh, as, as we, as we go along. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure if it wasn't for black market activities, Greece would have collapsed completely by now. Um, uh, very quickly, um, your thoughts on Japan? So Japan is adopting what I think is an unnecessary, uh, easy money policy of expanding rapidly the, the amount of yen, and of course, this is creating a a boomlet uh, in the stock market. I've noticed now whether it really shows up in real economic growth. I don't know, but I'll tell you something interesting. I, I've never really bought into the idea that Japan was suffering tremendously from deep deflation and, and recession. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you saw this article in the Economist that was run several years ago, but they showed the statistics of, say, the last 10 years of growth of the G8 countries, and the United States uh, was near the top uh, in real GDP growth, and Japan was near the bottom. But then when they switched the statistics to per capita real GDP, Japan went to the top and the U.S. went to the bottom, practically. Really? Interesting. Yeah, and basically, the, the reason is is because Japan doesn't doesn't have much of a population growth, while the U.S. has been growing at 4% or more per year due to uh, immigration and what have you. Um, so in per capita terms, Japan is doing just fine. So I'm not sure why. And, you know, I don't know if you've been to Japan before, but if you've been to Tokyo and these countries, it's buzzing with activity, and they've got every uh, gadget imaginable and technology and so forth. I just don't understand why. I guess it's because the stock market was still in the in the doldrums. They decided to adopt this policy, but it certainly is working. And I'm sure Milton Friedman, uh, he was he, Milton Friedman, uh, who was a dear friend of mine and uh, was very strong advocate of this very policy of the key to getting Japan going again is to pump more uh, paper money into the system, uh, and, and more Japanese yen, and that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, well, so, we've, got, uh, we, we've got sort of part one of that, you know, the, the, the results are yet to work through, perhaps. Um, but I can't help but feel that, uh, you know, the, the reason that they're so aggressively um, you know, pumping paper into the system is because it's the only way with a quadrillion yen of debt that the government can now finance itself, given that the savings, you know, savings are now being withdrawn by elderly, an elderly population, an increasingly elderly population who needed to subsist on. Well, and they're going to have to put it in the stock market and, and to earn some dividends, to earn some income. I don't think uh, dividend-paying stocks are as popular in Japan as they are in the United States. Uh, but this is this is what you have to do because interest rates have actually declined in Japan uh, as a result of this policy. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but <laughs> yes. so they, they is forcing the people who are on savings to get out of that and invest in more risky assets, 
which would be the stock market. And that's ex- that's what's happening. It's happened in the U.S. for some time now. I've been a very um, a strong advocate of dividend-paying stocks, and, and we're getting a 6 or 7% return on our money. This, this is leveraged, closed-end funds and so forth, investment uh, funds, but it's been a very successful strategy, and that's what's happening in, J- in Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, s- switching uh, lastly in the few minutes we've got to gold, there's been huge volatility in the gold price recently. Um, and uh, there seem to be two camps. Uh, you've got investors who play the trend and uh, when the trend goes, they get out or they short it. And you've got uh, all these people, I suppose, all over the world, but more predominantly, certainly in Asia, who are accumulating gold simply because they distrust their domestic paper currencies, um, <laughs> like instinctively, perhaps. Um, and this, it seems, uh, is producing a difference uh, in that you've got the capital markets have turned sellers, whereas the people who are, if you like, putting their long term savings, uh, you know, rather than having rupees, or yuan or whatever, um, uh, are actually uh, increasing their buying. Um, This isn't going to work out well at the end of the day, is it? Well, first of all, I think there's two factors at work here. One is, I believe, that with the fear factor of inflation and the the constant um, active monetary policy of expanding the money supply and sharply reducing interest rates, that combination led to gold and silver uh, becoming almost hot commodities and running up too far too fast. So I always felt that uh, when gold was at 1900 and you had all these pundits predicting 2500 or higher gold, that that was typical of a topping pattern uh, technically. Uh, and so we actually, in my newsletter, uh, sold our ETFs in gold and silver back in late 2011. It turned out to be a very good call. And, uh, and, and the other factor is the fear factor, the fact that after five years, after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, there is a sense of, uh, um, that things are getting back to normal to some extent. Uh, the economy is is recovering, and we haven't had this collapse that a second collapse that people are predicting. So I actually think the premium, the fear premium on gold is coming down as well. So those are the two factors. It's a technical uh, sell off, and there's also this uh, feeling that uh, well maybe I mean, even even interest rates have come down in Europe, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so, yes. Yeah. So th- those are two factors to indicate that the fear factor uh, has has been reduced. Now I think it's all largely artificial. Uh, we, we we can't ignore the Fed policy, the QE one, two, three, and eternity. Uh, all of that playing its its role to create this uh, feeling that that we've the the worst is behind us. Uh, Having all said that, the question is, where is the bottom going to reach? And I still think the jury is still out on that. I mean, uh, the fact that gold is up 20 bucks and then down $20. Look, there's one scenario that argues that gold could go substantially lower if the dollar strength, the strength of the dollar continues to rally. Uh, given what Europe is doing, given what what Japan is doing, the dollar is looking better than those currencies, right? So um, if interest rates finally start rising in the U.S., gosh, the dollar could rally even more and gold could head down even further. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit uh, agnostic right now on the, on the gold price. The gold mining stocks are looking very attractive at this point. I mean, if you look at I am gold or Numod, uh, even Hecla. I was looking at Hecla the other day, and there's some heavy insider buying going on on that stock. Um, suggests uh, you know very rather high highest dividend yield in some of these stocks that we've ever seen four or five percent dividend that you can get. 
on uh, mining stocks. Uh, they're selling at PE ratios of under nine or eight. Uh, so from the mining stocks point of view, they look pretty attractive at this stage. Yes, I think um, it, in, inevitably with everything that's been going on in um, you know gold and silver, that uh, they have really been hit very, very badly. So uh, that's an interesting point, I think, uh, to end on. So I'd like to say, Mark, thank you very much indeed for taking our time to talk to us. And, um, you know, hopefully things, your, your optimism will be borne out. Well, I, I would like to think so. There's much ruin in a nation, as Adam Smith said, and... Uh, I do have that that optimism, but I don't want to be Pollyannish either. We do have serious problems. We know the solutions. We're just not willing to to take them at this point. And I hate to I hate to see austerity get a bad name because that's the only solution. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.